Hey, what's going on everybody? Commander Crane here and we're back with another deck tech today. So today we're going to be talking about Pioneer Dragons. We're going to be having a $50 budget build and then we're also going to have a non-budget build. So uh, I'm probably going to mention this at the end of the video, um, but just in case I don't, let me know in the comments below. What do you like about the deck? What do you not like about the deck? Is there anything you would change? Um, is there any deck list that you want to build that you want to send me that you want me to build? Let me know in the comments below what you think and as always i will leave the deck lists uh in the description if you want to check them out uh, it'll obviously be on mtg goldfish so alrighty, so we're gonna get right into it here so 50 dollar pioneer dragon so for those who don't know i love dragons i love it it's my favorite tribe to play um in pretty much all of magic honestly and um so i wanted to share a 50 dollar budget list uh, that you can start playing in pioneer so, we're going to hop right into it here. So, creatures, four Bone Crusher Giant. For those who play red in Pioneer and Commander, well, not, well, not so much Commander, but Modern, um, you guys know what this card does. Two mana, uh, instant. Damage can't be prevented this turn. Stomp deals two damage to any target. And then the other side's a four, three for three. Um, whenever it is targeted by a spell, it deals two damage to that spell's controller. Just an incredibly efficient card. Uh, it kills smaller creatures, it domes our opponent, and it's a really, really efficient three drop, which is just great for the deck. Next off, we have Thunderbreak Regent. So four, four for four with flying. Whenever a dragon you control becomes a target of a spell or an ability an opponent controls, Thunderbreak Regent deals three damage to that player. So I know Thunderbreak Regent can seem a little underwhelming at first, but when you play the card is when you figure out how excellent this card is. Um, obviously, most of the time it's going to be the biggest creature in the sky, um, and the three damage can definitely wear an opponent out. I know... You know, when you're playing, like, multiples of them, it can be really nice because if they want to, like, target any of your uh, creatures with, like, a removal spell or something, they're going to be taking, you know, three, six damage, which adds up. And also, it's whenever a dragon. It's not just Thunderbreak Regent. So, the card is absolutely incredible. I love how cheap it is, too. I mean, it's only, like, a little over a dollar for, you know, each, which is just awesome. It's a great card. I highly suggest picking it up, even if you're not playing the deck. We have one Varix Bladewing. So this is a bit of a throwback from the original Dominaria set. I know the card wasn't played a lot in Standard, but we're playing one in our list today. So it's a 4-4 four, four for 4 with Kicker 3 with Flying. When it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, create Karx Bladewing, a legendary 4-4 four, four Red Dragon creature token. So uh, overall, it's a pretty good rate. 4-4 four, for four, 4 Flyer. It's a Dragon. And then if you pay an additional 3, you get another 4-4. Four, four. We wanted one more 4 drop in the deck. And all the other ones that were available to us, unfortunately, were not, we weren't able to fit into the budget. So that's why we're playing Varric's Blaming. Still a very efficient creature. Not as good as Thunderbreak Regent. Really, none of the four drops are, but still great either way. So next, we move to the five drops. Four Glorybringer. For those who play, watch my um, videos for deck lists and see the things that I post. You guys know I love Glorybringer. So four, four for three and two red. Uh, it's a dragon with flying in haste. You may exert Glory Bringer as it attacks. When you do, it deals four damage to target to target non-dragon creature and opponent controls. An exerted creature won't untap during your next untap step. So Glory Bringer is just an awesome card overall. Se secretly, it's the best dragon in our deck. We'd be playing it even if we weren't playing a budget deck. The card just it hits so hard. It kills most of the creatures in the metagame, other than like Shieldred. Um, and it's just, it's just so good. I mean, I can't even describe how good this card is. Um, I know it can seem a little underwhelming at first, but once you play it, you really figure out how good this card is. Then you get like two of them in play and you're off. I mean, you're, you're just so far ahead. If you're, you know, glory bringer, exert, kill a creature, play another one, exert. I mean, you're, you're going to win that game. So we're playing four of them. Card's absolutely incredible. And it's less than a dollar a piece. I mean, 360 for a play set is absolutely awesome. So now we're moving to Skargan Hellkite. This is uh, definitely a very uh, forgotten uh, dragon overall. So 4-4 four, for four, four, 3-2 red, once again, with Riot, which means the creature enters the battlefield with a plus 1, plus 1 counter or haste. So it can be a 4-4 four, four flying haste or just a 5-5 five, five for 5. And flying, 3-2 uh, red, Skargan Hellkite deals 2 damage divided as you choose among 1 or 2 targets. 
activate this ability only if Scargon and Hellkite has a plus one plus one counter on it. So Scargon and Hellkite is a very interesting card where, you know, once again, you know, you can either just, if you want to get the beats in, 4-4 four, four Flying Haste, just get in there. Or the other side is it has the activated ability where you can, you know, divide two damage. Um, so if you need to play defensively, you can play the Scargon and Hellkite with the counter. If you're trying to be aggressive, you play it as the 4-4 four, four Flying Haste. Um, this is a really great card overall. I really like Scargon and Hellkite. It's unfortunately not as good as most of the other 5-drop dragons or any of them. But it's still a very powerful card and it fits, you know, fits into our budget very nicely. So... Then we have one Storm Breath Dragon. So 4-4, four, four, once again, it's, a, it's kind of an ongoing theme. 4-4 four, four for 3 and 2 red. Flying Haste Protection from White. Uh, 5 and 2 red for Monstrosity 3. If this creature isn't monstrous, put 3 one counters on it and it becomes monstrous. When it becomes monstrous, it deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of cards in that player's hand. So Stormbreath Dragon is an absolutely awesome card. It's very great in the metagame, obviously, with having the protection from white. You might be thinking, well, why aren't you playing four of those and, you know, less Gargan Hellkites? It's a really simple answer. It doesn't fit into our budget as well. Um, like, for an example, you know, I mean, like, four Glorybringers is 360 but one, one Stormbreath Dragon is almost $2.50. So, it doesn't fit quite into our budget. Obviously, you know, if you're building this deck, you don't have to play one Stormbreath Dragon. You know, if you're just playing Pioneer to play Pioneer, you can play four Stormbreath Dragons. I love Stormbreath Dragon. If it was a little cheaper, we'd definitely be playing four of them. But to keep it in the $50, we're playing one Stormwrath Dragon. Card's awesome. It's really uh, great against some of the removal spells like Fateful Absence that's in the metagame. You know, like uh, against Blue-White Control. They have a very hard time dealing with Stormwrath Dragon. So, awesome card. I love playing in the list. So, we're going to move to our non-creature spells. So, we have two Spike Field Hazards. So, you can either play it as a land and it enters tap. Taps for red. Or one red instant deals one damage to any target. If a permanent dealt damage this way would die, exile instead. So obviously the exile effect can be relevant depending on the list. Um, it's really great at picking off like Lana Rolfs, Elvish Mystics. Um, also, if you're, you know, if you need to burn a, a planeswalker or burn your opponent, you know, you have that option too. But most of the time, we're just going to play this as a land just to get that flexibility if we need it. So just a great card overall. We're just playing two of them though. For Wild Slash. One red instant has ferocious. If a creature, um, if you control a creature with power four or greater, damage that can't be prevented this turn, wild slash deals two damage to any target. So you might be thinking, well, why aren't you playing something like play with fire? Well, it's a very simple answer. Play with fire is does not fit our budget. You know, with wild slash, you know, four of them, buck sixty, it fits a lot better into our budget. Once again, if you have Play With Fire, definitely play them over Wild Slash. But to fit them in the $50, we're playing four Wild Slash. Most of the time, it does the same thing anyways. You know, if you're, if you're hitting a land of war off, it's going to do the same thing as Play With Fire. Just obviously having that option to hit your opponent in Scry can be relevant. Then we have four Draconic Roar. So red and one for an instant. As an additional cost to cast this spell, you may reveal a dragon card from your hand. Draconic Roar deals 3 damage to target creature. If you reveal a dragon card or control the dragon, as you cast the spell, Draconic Roar deals 3 damage to that creature's controller. So, I want to emphasize the control a dragon part of it, because a lot of people forget the fact that if you, you can either reveal one if you don't have one in play, but if you have a dragon in play, you don't have to reveal one. You don't have to give that information to your opponent. A lot of people don't realize the card says that. Um, you know, myself included when I first started playing Draconic Roar. But just keep in mind, you don't have to reveal a dragon if you already, you know, if you already control one. But moving on. So it's very similar to Searing Blaze for those who played a lot of modern. It's three to a creature, three to an opponent. The card's just awesome two mana six damage you know and it's very flavorful with the dragons so four of draconic roar it's it's a great card to play then we have two mizia mortars so for the, again for those who watch my videos you guys know how much i love this card one one red one sorcery deals four damage to target creature you don't control with overload three red 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 um you may cast the spell for its overload cost if you change target to text to each so pretty simple Two, dam two mana, four damage to a creature opponent controls, or six mana, four to all their creatures. It's a really flexible card. You know, it, there's a lot of, like, relevant cards that are have four toughness in the metagame, so being able to pick those off is really, really important. And late game, if we've got a bunch of mana, then we'll just, we'll just torch the whole board. Works out great. So, moving to the artifacts. 
We have four Orb of Dragonkind. So, red and one artifact. We can tap one and tap. Add two mana of any combination of colors. Spend this mana only to cast dragon spells or activate abilities of dragons. Uh, red, and, red and tap. Sacrifice the orb. Look at the top seven cards of your library. You may put a dragon card from among them into your hand and the rest in the bottom of your library. So, orb of dragonkind is a great card for a lot of reasons. So, one, uh, in Pioneer, there's not a lot of non-creatures well non-creature permanents that tap for mana that are like one and two converted mana costs so like obviously green you know gets like lana Elves and elvish mystic and it gets like sylvan caryatid and you know all the other random two drop dorks um you know not having mind stone in the metagame makes it a little challenging but it works out because orb of dragon kind obviously does what it needs to do we play it on turn two, next the following turn, play a land, we have four mana, and then the next turn we have five mana. It ramps us, it does what we need to do, and what's really great is late game, being able to sacrifice it for the one red and then get another dragon to keep the pressure on is awesome. Uh, especially in this deck and what's great is you know it's four for four of them for six dollars that's not too shabby for our budget list we're playing four of them it's an absolutely necessity if you get an opening hand with a couple lands and an orb most of the time that's going to be a keep um just the card's absolutely incredible i was really excited when it was printed and it's perfect for our deck list here so then we got four dragon's horde so it's a three mana artifact Whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, put a gold counter on Dragon's Horde. You can tap, remove a gold counter from Dragon's Horde to draw a card, or you can tap it for one mana of any color. So, it's just another mana rock that's in our deck. Um, not technically quite as good as Orb of Dragonkind, but what's really unique about Dragon's Horde is, you know, either using it for the mana or being able to tap it to draw cards when we play all of our different dragons is awesome so it again keeps all the gas coming and it makes you know it helps us cast our dragons once we get to that point in the game which is awesome so four dragon swords they're also really cheap you know they're like a buck a piece absolutely stellar card so lands we have 22 lands plus the two spike field hazards but nothing too crazy for a budget list we have 20 mountains and two haven of the spirit dragon so we can tap it for colorless we can tap it for one mana of any color for a dragon spell, or we can tap two, sacrifice it, return a, dr a dragon or Ugin. Not that we're playing any Ugins, but we can return either one from our graveyard to our hand. It's really great for late game. If we're playing a really grindy matchup, you know, like all of our dragons, you know, we're trading resources, dragons are going to the graveyard, and we just buy them back with the Haven of the Spirit Dragon. Just awesome card uh definitely creeping up in price a little bit i mean two dollars you know is two dollars but you know the card's absolutely incredible um if you're gonna play a non-budget version you probably would want still probably two you don't want to get flooded with them because you know they can't make they can only make red four dragons but just playing two is a great number so now we're gonna move to the sideboard so we have four tormod's crypts very simple it's zero mana sacrifice it exile all cards from target player's graveyard tormod's crypt's a great card they're cheap, gets rid of those pesky graveyards, and we don't have to devote a turn or anything to doing it. We just play the Tormod script. I mean, you can play it turn one, turn two, turn three, whatever you want. So we're playing four of them for, you know, there's a lot of good graveyard decks right now in the metagame. We need to, we need to keep them under wraps. Two Pithing Needle, one colorless artifact. As it enters the battlefield, choose a card name. Activate abilities of sources with a chosen name can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. It's great for stopping planeswalkers. Um, it's great for stopping just miscellaneous like um, activated abilities. You know, it's great like stopping like well, like witches oven. You know, obviously cauldron familiar. All the planeswalkers. There's just a lot of different things that this shuts down, which is great. So, and it's what's really nice is I mean they're really cheap too. They're reprinting this card like crazy. So it's a it's great for us because it fits in the budget deck. Two braid. Red one, instant, choose one, deals three damage to target creature, destroy target artifact. Just a really flexible card overall. Most of the reason we're playing this is so we can destroy artifacts if needed. But hey, against some matchups, you want all the removal possible. So we have, we're playing a braid for that. Um, I don't think there's any other better options if you're just looking to destroy artifacts efficiently. But just being able to do, just playing a braid is really, really flexible. And that's why we're playing it. It's just a great card. Four Damping Sphere, so two mana artifact. If a land is tapped for two or more mana, it produces one colorless instead. Each player, uh, each spell a player casts costs one more to cast for each other spell that players cast this turn. 
So really simple. It's just it's great against the decks where they're looking to play you know a thousand spells each turn. Uh, it's also really good against uh, the Nykthos decks because they can't make all that absurd amount of mana. Secretly very good against Phoenix. I personally like bringing Damping Sphere. If they're on the Arclight Phoenix, you know, reanimation plan, um, they need at least six mana to be able to bring the Phoenixes back, which, you know, if they're on that plan, it's a really great way to stop them. And we're playing four of them just because it's that important. One Fry, one red instant. Well, one red and one instant. This spell can't be countered. Fry deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker that's white or blue. So we're just playing the one. It's a very flexible card. I mean, it, it, it takes out, oh, what do we've got? We've got Teferis. It takes out um, Thing in the Ice. It takes out any of the pesky spirits that our opponents are playing. Uh, it takes out any of the humans and like the, the mono white, green, white humans decks. Overall, it's just a really flexible card. Five damage is a lot too. For two mana, like five damage, that's just awesome. So Fry, it's a great card. You could play more depending on your meta game. I, it's it's a great card to play. And two Sweltering Suns. So Red Red 1 Sorcery. Sweltering Suns deals three damage to each creature. In cycling three, we can discard it, pay three, and draw a card. So pretty simple. Sweltering Suns is a great board wipe. Uh, for the decks that we need it against like elves humans spirits that kind of thing really any small creature deck we're going to bring this in so what's really great it's a, it's a great budget option too gets the job done so this is our 50 dollars list um so for those who are looking for a non-budget list um so I have a mono red list I'm going to share with you today, um, but for those who haven't checked it out already, I do have a Gruel Dragons list. I have actually two different kinds of Gruel Dragons lists in the same video. Um, I'll probably put it in the uh, description below letting you know if you want to check it out. Um, that has a Gruel list, which is what I would consider the non-budget of dragons. But if you say you want to play mono red dragons, just mono red, you don't want to worry about any other colors, I have a list that I'm going to share with you today too. So... It's going to be very, very functionally similar to our $50 list. I'm just going to go over the different cards that we're playing. So, starting off, instead of playing Varix Blade, we have Atsushi the Blazing Sky. So, 4-4 four, four for 4 with Flying and Trample. When it dies, choose 1. We can either exile the top 2 cards of your library until the end of turn. Until at the end of your next turn, you may play those cards or create three treasure tokens. So just a really efficient card overall. If your opponent ends up, you know, removing it, we're going to get some card advantage or tokens to help ramp us. And so she's just a great card overall. We would definitely fit it in the budget list if we can, but unfortunately, you know, it being five and a half dollars a piece makes it, well, four and a half makes it a little tough to fit it into the list. So same as before, we have the four Thunder Breaks, the four Glory, the four Bone Crusher. I forgot to mention that. Oh, so four gold span dragons. So those who have played a lot of arena, played some standard, you guys know what this card does. So four, four for three and two red. Flying haste. Whenever gold span dragon attacks or becomes the target of a spell, create a treasure token. Treasures you control have tap, sacrifice, add two mana, not one of any color. So obviously a strict upgrade over Skargon Hellkite. It's just an incredible card. You know, it ramps us. It gets the opponent down. It gets the opponent dead. I mean, that's exactly what we want to do. Obviously, not a very budget-friendly card, considering a place that is over the entire cost of the last deck. So, Goldspin Dragon is very good, though. It's definitely wor worth the pickup. If you're on a budget, though, don't be afraid. We've got Skargon Hellkite and Stormbreath Dragon to help you out. So, you don't have to worry about it. But if you do want to play it, the card's awesome. And... Also, it's getting reprinted in Jumpstart. Even better. So if you end up picking some up from Jumpstart, you can play it. Then we have two Stormbreath Dragons. So as opposed to, you know, we were only playing one the last one. This one we're playing two. Um, mostly because I personally think Goldspin Dragon is better currently than Stormbreath Dragon. But again, if you want to play St Stormbreath Dragons, play it. Card's absolutely incredible. Makes the white players mad. It's awesome. So... I guess a quick, I'll, I'll skip a little bit. So we still have the four Orb of Dragon Kinds, but instead of the Dragon Sword, we're playing Sarkon Fireblood. Um, another card that does not fit into our budget list, but is still very, very good. So three loyalty, red, red, one. Um, you get, uh, Plus one, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. Plus one, add two mana of any combination of colors. Spend it only to cast a Dragon spell. Minus seven, create four, five, five dragons with flying. So essentially it's doing a similar role as Dragon's Horde. 
Um, you know, it's making the mana and it's giving us card advantage in a way, which is really great. And then uh, this obviously has the emblem where the emblem is most of the time just going to win you the game. I have emblem Sarkon Fireblood quite a few times. You'll actually do it a lot more than you think with this list, especially with if you're playing against a deck that's not as aggressive. You can play this turn three and they might just not have an answer for it. So Sarkon Fireblood's awesome card. I really like it. Helps get those dragons out there really fast. So that's why we're playing three of them. Not creature spell is the only one that's different. We talked about it earlier. Play with fire instead of wild slash. So obviously it deals two damage to any target. If a player's dealt damage this way, scry one. Um, just a little bit better than wild slash. They're still not too pricey. You're gonna be paying about two dollars a piece for them. Play with fire, great card. It's a great one drop. Still jamming it. Only other thing that changed, well, the sideboard did too, and we'll get to that in a second. So so not being budget, our lands did change a little bit, and I'll explain that here. So we have two Den of the Bugbear. Uh, it's the great fast lane from uh, uh, D and D Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. If you choose, if you control two or more other lands, Den of the Bugbear enters the battle with a tap. We can tap it for a red. We can also tap three and a red, make it a three-two goblin, and when it attacks, create a one-one red goblin that's tapped and attacking. Um, obviously, uh, this kind of effect's really great. We're playing, you know, only red lands, so we're playing two Den of the Bugbears. Same as before, two Haven of the Spirit Dragon. Only 13 Mountain here, because we've got a couple other spicy lands we're playing. So four Ramanap Ruins. So it's a desert. We can tap it for a colorless. We can tap it, pay one life, add a red mana to our mana pool. Or we can tap two and two red, sacrifice the desert, deals two damage to each opponent. So for those who didn't play standard at the time, I know this card can look a little bit underwhelming. But let me tell you, having that late game reach in a land is absolutely incredible. That's why we're playing four of them. This card's just stellar. You know, we get in there with the dragons, you know, whittle our opponent down. Maybe they're able to control the board. Then it's just, you know, end step, hit you for two, untap. We have a second one, hit you for two, and they're done. So we're playing four of them. It's really awesome. And quite honestly, they're also extremely cheap. So we couldn't quite fit them into our $50 list, but they're still a great pickup. And then we have one Sokenzin, Crucible of Defiance. Legendary land taps for a red, or we can channel it for three and a red. They discard it, make two 1-1 one, one colorless spirits, and they gain haste. So, just a real, it's a freebie. It's like Beseju and Odwara. It's just, it's just free. We're playing just one. Sideboard is changes a little bit, but not too much overall. Three Torment Scripts instead of four. Um, most of the reason we cut one is because we're playing one Grafdigger's Cage. Uh, one colorless artifact. Creature cards in graveyards and libraries can't enter the battlefield. Players can't cast spells from graveyards or libraries. Uh, it's really great for shutting down, like, um, oh, man, what's really good? Like, Abs and Grease Fang is the good one. It's also really good against the Collected Company decks because they're not able to put their creatures into play. So it's just really flexible. And we're just playing the one Graft Digger's Cage. Two Pithy Needle, same as before. Two a Braid. Only three Damping Sphere because we're playing some other spicy card. Two Anger the Gods. Red, red, one. Deals three damage to each creature. If a creature dealt damage this way, would die this turn. Exile instead. This card is essentially the same price as Sweltering Suns, but to be able to fit it in the list, I wasn't able to fit it into the $50 one without cutting something else, so we decided to go Sweltering Suns, but I mean, this card is hardly... It's essentially the same price. Um, I would say Anger of the Gods is probably a little bit better in the format, but they're essentially both going to do the exact same thing. So you can play either one, but in our non-budget, we are playing two Anger of the Gods. And then two Rampaging Ferocidon. I know it's not a dragon, but you got to hear me out. So it's a 3-3 three, three for 3 with Menace. Players can't gain life. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield, Rampaging Ferocidon deals 1 damage to that creature's controller. So... This card does a little bit of everything. Um, for those who didn't play with this card or haven't played with it yet, essentially, if you're ahead on the board and you have a Rampaging Frosted on, you're probably going to win the game. Um, this card can do a massive amount of damage and also preventing life can be relevant against quite a few different decks in the format. So... Rampaging Frosted on, we're playing two of them. The card's abs it's, it's just really good. It's a it's a great three drop. You know, it makes blocks awkward and obviously being able to deal one damage to each creature that enters. Well, each deals one damage to their to our opponent or us. It's also symmetrical, so you have to remember that. But if our opponent is going really wide with like humans or elves, it's just great to be able to do e extra damage with them. Then they can't block any of our flyers and we just finished the job. So Frostdown's awesome. We're playing two of them. The card, it's just, it's to the point where you have to play it. If you're playing mono red, 
it's just, I mean, even like the main lists, you know, like if you look at mono red lists that are in Pioneer, they're playing Rampaging Ferocidon, one of the best dinosaurs easily. So that is Pioneer mono red dragons. So obviously we had our $50 Pioneer list, which comes in at $49.84 and our non-budget only $170. That's not bad, honestly, for a Pioneer deck. I was really surprised when I saw the price. I mean, if you really look at it, the, the four gold span dragons is like a third of the price at $52, you know, for a play set. So, I mean, other than a few cards, this the whole list is very inexpensive to play, mostly because you don't have to worry about all those pesky dual lands and such. So, that is Pioneer Dragons. I hope you guys like watching the video. Once again, let me know in the comments. What do you like? What do you not like? What would you change about it? What color would you prefer to splash? Would you not want to play green? Would you prefer Monterey? Do you want to play white, black? What do you want to play with dragons? And also, if there's a deck that you want to send me or you want me to build, let me know in the comments below. And as always, I will leave the deck lists uh, in the description and then I will also leave the video of our Gruel Dragons list just in case, you know, you don't want to go through the hassle of looking for it. I'd like to thank everybody for joining me today. I'll see you in the next video.